Are you interested in adding pessary fittings to your practice? Then tune in to hear our speakers in today's episode as we talk about all things pessaries. Hello, friends. This is Lynn Schulte, and you are listening to the Birth Healing Summit podcast. We are here for meaningful conversations that will transform the way you work with pregnant and postpartum clients. Whether it is a new perspective, tool, or technique, you'll be able to implement it into your practice today. I invite you to sit back, listen with an open mind, and grab the golden nugget today's guest has to offer. Now let's get started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this podcast episode where we have a little pessary panel going on here. Uh, Super excited to introduce you to Jenny Tuffler Crum and then Terry Robertson Elder. Um, Jenny is a physiotherapist up in Ontario, Canada. Uh, She's been working with pessaries in her practice since 2018, and she also has courses on pessary um, through Pelvic Health Solutions. So welcome. Welcome, Jenny. Thank you. Hi. Hi. And then Terry is a physical therapist in North Carolina, and she's on faculty at Georgia State University, and she also does continued education courses through Pelvic Global. So welcome, Terry. Hi. Thanks All for right. having me. Thank you. Thanks for being here, both of you. So we're going to be talking about, let's start um, with that first, the new definition for prolapse. Which one of you two wants to talk about what, what has changed or what are they saying with that? You go ahead, Jenny. You had a good blurb there. Sure. <laughs> Literally have it written down. Um, so yeah, the International Urogynecological Consultation in 2021 came out with a new consensus, con- a new statement, a <laughs> consensus statement, mm-hmm. um, which outlines um, a new clinical prolapse definition. So in order to diagnose someone with clinical prolapse, they need to have anatomical prolapse, so tissue laxity or descent to the hymenal ring on Valsalva with bearing down, and they need to have symptoms with it. So either the primary symptom that our clients report, that bulging heaviness symptom, or a functional symptom like bladder or bowel retention problems, tissue irritation from hanging outside the vagina, those kinds of things. So if someone has tissue stretch, but they are asymptomatic, then they would have maybe anatomical laxity, but we wouldn't say they have clinical prolapse. So that's an important distinction that's come up. Okay. Anything you want to add to that, Terry? Sure, sure. So um, I, you know, that's not to say that if someone came into the clinic with a a grade or stage one um, or early stage two, where it's not to the the introitus or the the uh, hymenal ring, um, that we would say you don't have clinical prolapse, you're fine, and shoo them out our door. We certainly would still address all their concerns, and there's still definitely treatment options and drivers of symptoms that we want to look at, um, like mucosal changes or sensitivity, um, and certainly help them navigate the process as well. Um, and it may be that um, you might not see a significant clinical prolapse, but when you take some other measurements or you do some other assessments, you do know that maybe they are at a higher risk for progression. And so maybe they still do want some support of a pessary or something like that. Okay. So let's talk about pessaries then. And, you know, what is a pessary and why would we want to add it or into our plan of care for someone? Yeah. A uh, pessary is a device, it, it tends to be a silicone device that goes into the vagina and it's to support the pelvic organs um, and support that uh, tissue laxity for the goal of being symptom um, or function relief uh, for pelvic organ prolapse and also stress incontinence. Yeah. Okay. Terry, do you want there to are some. That? Sure, there are just a couple of other specialized pessary uses, like ones for uh, cervical um, incompetence during pregnancy, Um, and they can also be used for like medication delivery, Um, but typically as we talk about pessaries, it's the the use for for pelvic organ prolapse or stress urinary incontinence, Um, and I really do like to, you know, when I'm speaking to someone who has no idea what a pessary is, um, let them know and, and use kind of the analogy of the sports bra for your pelvic organs. Um, I also really like, um, you know, talking about as a metaphor, um, vision changes. And so some people might wear glasses, which is, you know, equivalent to like an external support garment, like the, the EBB shorts or the SRC, um, and then the contact lenses would be more like a pessary. So you're using something that kind of lifts, 
is inside um, versus LASIK or, you know, surgical yeah. repair. Um, yeah. And so it's nice to know that you have options and sometimes people do, you know, have a cert, you know, had they have LASIK and they still have to wear contacts or glasses. And so knowing that is, you know, an equivalent metaphor as well. Yeah. Okay. So why, um, when do we want to use those pessaries? Like when in our clinical plan of care, would we want to think, I should really think about doing a pessary for my clients? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's nice because um, the Society of OBGYNs of Canada have a statement uh, that they came out with in 2021 for pessaries. Um, and they suggest anyone who presents with symptomatic prolapse or stress incontinence can use a pessary um, or trial a pessary and be fit for one. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really great to know that it's not necessarily that we have to gatekeep and say you have to do X number of pelvic physio sessions before you can do a pessary. It's more so when we're presenting all the options to our clients, we can say we can do nothing. We can do pelvic floor muscle. We can use a pessary. We can change your posture and position. We can try hypopressive. We can present them with all of the things that we know, and then they can choose based off of what they want to pursue first. And you can try it at the beginning. You can try it at the end. We can try it whenever you want to. And, and so does pessary use, you know, I, I think of the um, abdominal bracing, especially in the postpartum period, you know, everyone's like, oh, we should brace our bellies. And I'm like, it depends on how we're using it, because some people just like then rest into that brace kind of you know, then the muscles start to atrophy if they're not using the muscles. So is that the same concept if we use a pessary internally mm -hmm. that that people might get weaker if they if we put a pessary in offering support versus them just trying to figure out how to manage that pressure and get strength on their own? Go ahead, Terry. Yeah, that's a common concern. People are afraid, oh, if I use this pessary, it's like a crutch, you know, yes. like things are yeah. gonna get weaker. But in fact, it can actually help improve um, because you are lifting the organs up off of the pelvic floor muscles so that they can actually function effectively. If you have a pelvic organ that's sitting down, you know, up at the introitus or even beyond, um, you can't do those, those pelvic floor muscles, um, strengthening effectively. So lifting it up can help the pelvic floor muscles work more effectively and get stronger. Um, and you can also potentially help, um, with long-term changes, um, that can help improve some of the connective tissue support as well. So it's not a crutch. Um, yeah. Okay, good to know. So the, the pessary sitting above the pelvic floor muscles and may help the muscles be able to function better and get stronger, easier, hopefully easier. Now, what are the considerations for us dealing with postpartum women? Is there you know, do we have to wait a certain amount of time in order for us to, to consider using pessaries or what are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if someone has had, we wait for six weeks for anyone, right? Just to ensure that we have the uterine healing. And if they have had any tearing or episiotomy that the, we have tissue healing there. Um, but after that six week check-in, they have, or eight weeks, depending where you are geographically, right? Um, once you have that medical clearance from your doctor, it is safe to use a pessary at that time. And it can be very helpful for your client if they're having daily symptoms and they need to lift their newborn and they need to lift their toddler. And then they hear, oh, I have a pester, uh, prolapse. I should lay down with my bum up and I can't lift over three pounds or whatever the guidelines, the, the stuff is that's out there. Um, it's not as helpful. So it can be a really awesome tool to utilize pretty early in your postpartum uh, journey with acknowledging a couple of different things. So um, obviously one of them is going to be your birth experience. Um, if someone's had a traumatic birth experience, maybe those daily prolapse symptoms are extra distressing for them because it's an ongoing hypervigilant pelvic reminder of what unfolded during their birth that didn't go as they would have hoped. Um, whereas for other people, maybe a traumatic birth contributes to them not wanting to have to manage and maneuver a pessary in and out of the vagina every day. Um, and they would rather not think about that area or be as involved with it as might be required for some pessaries. So it, that could go either way, but that's a really important consideration when we're thinking, is this suitable for this client? And of course, that's a discussion that you're having with your client because they get to decide what they're up for or not. 
Yeah. Um, I know there's more considerations, Terry. <laughs> uh, you mean for particularly in the postnatal yeah. uh, individual? Um, yeah, it's certainly, certainly also looking at hormonal status and if uh, they are lactating, that is really important mm -hmm. um, to address tissue health. Uh, because we know that, you know, hormonally, it, it can be that um, there is, you know, a de-estrogen, de someone help me with that word, <laughs> de <-estrogenized, laughs> thank you. Uh, in the tissue, and that it can be supportive to use topical estrogen um, vaginally or another product like the hyaluronic um, moisturizers and things like that to help support tissue health, if, especially if we are introducing um, a, a pessary postnatally as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, oh, go ahead, Jenny. I was just going to say something else I consider is that um, if the pelvic floor muscles, just like if someone's had a knee replacement surgery and we have like a quad leg, if the pelvic floor muscles are resting after their vaginal birth. Um, there is always that potential that someone will be using their pessary temporarily to manage symptoms mm -hmm. as their body and connective tissues change over that early, you know, that year postpartum. Um, so just educating your clients, whenever anyone uses a pessary, there's always the potential for change over time, but acknowledging that they are in a flux period um, and that there is that potential that they might stop using their pessary or maybe they go up or down a size over the course of their treatment and over the course of their lifespan as things change um, based off their hormone profile. Well, I think it's... Yeah, and that's true. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, that's true for, for a lot of individuals is that they may change over time. They may not need a pessary after a certain amount of time, but certainly in the, the early postnatal, um, that duration is, is even more pronounced how, um, how tissue peeling can occur. Yeah. And, and does that affect then the size of the pessary or the, or the type of pessary we should be using as things are changing? Or what do we need to be aware of with those changes when it comes mm -hmm. to pessary use? I would say for myself clinically, what I've found is that the, I still use the same approach with clients when deciding what size or style of pessary might be suitable for them based off of their preference. If they are pursuing penetrative sexual acts, mm -hmm. um, if they want to manage their pessary um, and take it in and out as desired, maybe as frequently as every day or with only certain activities, or if they actually want to leave it in for longer periods of time. Those considerations, though, I have with all of my clients, regardless if they're postnatal or not. Um, so I haven't seen that it specifically influences which style of pessary I'm going to be using. Okay. Same. What, what do you notice about size though of pessary? Does that change over time? Especially I'm wondering with a postpartum client, if their tissues change to where they now need to size up or size down or in, in that regard, or does that stay consistent? Do you know? It can change. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It can change. Yeah, I know that's a super vague answer. Some people <laughs> stay the same and then some people increase or decrease the size as things go. It's true. Pessary use is very, very comfort based. So as much as we have kind of things as clinicians that we look for, how stretchy the tissues are, how wide or narrow the introitus is, how long or short the vagina is, as much as we have those anatomical considerations, it's always down to a good pessary is one that feels comfortable for the client and resolves their symptoms. So if we have to change it down the road for that, um, yeah. then we'll do that. Do you find then that as someone gets stronger, you know, so let's say someone is postpartum, their pelvic floor muscles have just gotten stretched to the brink, baby coming out, they're now, you know, I'm hoping that everyone is addressing their pelvic bone alignment and helping the bones come back to their original position, which you guys know I'm really passionate about. But, um, you know, I'm imagining their, their muscle strength is only at a certain level there. And then we put this pessary in and now their muscle strength improves. Does that change the pessary at all or not? Is there any? I don't think muscle strength is necessarily, um, certainly I consider muscle bulk. Like, so if someone has an avulsion, um, or they don't have that muscular support, that would help direct us um, to maybe a different pessary selection. Um, but I don't, um, so, and, and it could be that m m muscular strength as it improves over time, sure, maybe they 
can choose a different pestery. And that's why we really do check, you know, uh, and, and follow up with people and check every three to six months and refit them and replace pestries. And it, it is an ongoing thing that we, you know, look at uh, across, across time. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just think this is so such a huge topic for us to consider in that postpartum period, because if someone is dealing with a prolapse, they are having to carry that baby and that darn car seat is so heavy. And, you know, to have the ability to offer someone support to those structures, um, I think is huge. And so what do you guys see for your moms, your postpartum moms? Do they need it for their lifetime? Or do you find maybe sometimes a pessary could just be this temporary support that then maybe they don't need as they get stronger and their core gets back online and things like that? What are you guys seeing? Mm -hmm. Jenny? Um, some, some wean off of pessaries and many continue to use them. Pessaries. Okay. Um, okay. So it's not something where I've seen a really strong. I'd love as a pelvic physio to say everyone just strengthen their pelvic floor muscles. The introitus just closed right up and now they don't need a pessary. <laughs> I would love to say that that's what I saw all the time in clinic, right? Um, right. But some people still have the tissue laxity or they have a naturally more open or longer GH plus PB. Um, so they naturally have less support or they have the avulsion and there is ongoing weakness and lack of um, support there. Um, or you can have the strongest pelvic floor and just the degree of tissue stretch, things still sit low. Um, so yeah, some people do continue to use it ongoing for their whole life, similar to your contact lenses or your sports bra. You wear it for your comfort, whereas others might say at first they wore it all the time for ongoing comfort, then they only wore it while they were doing their uh, heavy lifting activities or playing volleyball. I have a couple clients who just use it for sport, um, or I have another client who just uses it when she gets sick for repetitive, mm. like bearing down with a heavy cough. Um, so it is really variable um, as to yeah. whether people change or stay the same. Jenny, you mentioned some letters there, and I know if a physio is listening, hopefully they understand that, but would you mind, um, real quickly, we don't have to dive really quick into it, but you said GH plus PB. Can you just describe what that is for people listening in so they understand why you just mentioned all those letters? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, so um, the POP-Q is the standard test that you can use to measure pelvic organ prolapse. And so apart from staging the prolapse itself, so how far the tissues have descended towards and then past the vaginal opening, GHM plus PB are the exterior measurements. So GH is genital hiatus, which is from the urethra opening to the posterior fourchette or that back opening of the introitus, the vaginal opening. And then PB is the perineal body. So the from the posterior fourchette to the middle of the rectal opening. Um, so together they make a length. So we have individual, there's lots of research around GH being a great indicator of levator hiatus size overall. So the larger there, um, the larger that length, the wider and more open, the less support we have underneath, which may be associated with levator anti avulsion. Um, and same with GH plus PB together. We have research for those measurements together. So that's why we mentioned those just to essentially landmark. And so we have an idea of the anatomy. I kind of say vaginal architecture when I'm talking with clients, <laughs> like what's just the setup here? right? Some people are very small and then other people are naturally longer. And some people, if I've seen them in pregnancy and I see them afterwards, I can note a change. And we have research in regards to those things as well. Yeah. Okay. Anything you would like to add to that, Terry? Uh, no, no, I think Jenny got okay. that one. Yeah, she did. She did a really good job. So, okay. I, I'm curious for both of you. Um, so in the United States, just late last year, we, it was, it became the APTA wrote a statement saying that it, you know, pessary fitting is within our scope of practice. And, and um, Jenny, you've been doing pessary fitting since 2018. And I know in Australia, they've been doing it for 10 plus years down there. So um, they're kind of setting the, the stage for us. How have you two been able to implement passory fitting into your practice? And what has your experience been in doing so? Yeah, go I ahead. can start because mine's pretty short. 
<laughs> I'm a US physio. So, you know, we, um, I just, uh, let's see, that scope of practice statement came out late 2021. So I took um, courses all throughout 2022 and did lab work and and um, mentoring and I've just really implemented it into my clinic. So I'm I'm a newbie, um, but I um, have started. I it's already you know prolapse is one of my um, practice kind of niches that I love uh, to help people with. So um, so it is. Uh, really have been so helpful for me as well personally. So I I love being able to offer it, but wow. it is it is relatively new for me. Yeah. Okay. And Jenny, Jenny? how about you? Yeah. 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 Um. Yes. Took the uh, another course in 2017. Implemented in 2018. I dove right in. I got the autoclave. I got the fitting kits. I spent all the money. Um. And <laughs> I've been doing pedicure fitting since then. Um. As a pelvic health physio here in Ontario, Canada. Um, the majority of my caseload is pelvic health and a fraction of it is pes fitting. So even though I have it as an offering to my clients and I love being able to say, Hey, this might be an option for you. I can do that next week. I love being able to say that, yeah. um, compared to, Oh, I have to go get a guy go to the gynecologist or go see someone else. So I love having it as a service offering. Um, and I also get referrals from other clinicians at the stage as well. So maybe others who don't have the ability to set up pessary fittings in their clinic, or I do get referrals from like gynecologists, family doctors, et cetera, who are starting to pick this up in their clinic and refer out to physiotherapy so that we have more time and can follow up and do the management piece yeah. with their in Canada. We just need them to sign a checkbox so that we can do all that. Um, so happy to do that as well. But even with the focus I've had, it's not my entire practice. Awesome. Good to know. Good to know. I think that's one of my, the one thing kind of stopping me from jumping into this and, and doing pessary fitting in my practice was that that's, I don't want to do that all day long. So that's good to know that maybe that won't happen. Um, all right, great. So let's dive back into this idea of postpartum pessary fitting. And is there anything else that we need to know as practitioners when we're considering using pessary fitting for someone who's just had a baby? Did we cover it all or is there something else we should know? The last thing that sticks out to me is that sometimes there's a hesitancy and a little bit of gatekeeping from clinicians saying, oh, I want you to wait until six months postpartum or X, Y, Z. And that's kind of coming from a place of, of course, wanting to make sure the patient is safe, but also our own bias maybe towards our manual therapy, our pelvic floor muscle training, pressure management strategies. Those things are all top notch. I'm not saying don't do those things, but also just being aware if the client is medically safe to have a pessary and she, it could resolve her symptoms and complement all this other awesome work you're doing, why wait? We need a good argument to wait, not a good argument to do it at this stage. Mm, I yeah. love that. That's well so said. great. Well said. Yeah. Yes. And if I can add, you know, just yeah. the fact that if you're if you're a physio listening um, or someone who's interested in, in working with a physio, it really is like so great that we can offer this now because especially in postnatal, we're seeing people more often. We can help you um, if you need to, to change a different size or a different shape, because it is like, you know, finding the right pair of shoes sometimes. Um, and so there is just more follow-up. Um, we're already doing internal vaginal um, assessments and treatments. And, um, you know, we have more time with people. So there are a lot of reasons why I think uh, physios are perfectly suited really to, to offer this as, a, as, a, as an adjunct to what we do. Great. Well, well done, Terry, and kind of jump into the forefront of, of being at the USPTs here and, and jumping into pessary fitting. So thank you for paving the way for us. And, yeah. um, and Jenny, you actually offer courses to physios. Can you tell us a little bit about your pessary fitting courses? Yes. Yeah. Through Pelvic Health Solutions, um, myself and my colleague, Kara McDougall, we do Pessary's clinical integration and management for stress incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. So that is a one day online course with lecture, then background material, foundational things, integrating into clinic, and then a second day lab where we do bring and cue Pessary fittings with the option of doing another 
style of pessary if someone is appropriate on the course. So it just depends who we have on the course, if we can do a gal horn or um, a dish or another style, but definitely ring and cube fitting. So that way our clinicians are getting that hands-on ah, experience. And Perry yes. is holding up our ring and cube um, <laughs> pessaries there, which are really common. Ring, cube, and gal horn. Those are the three most common. Do you have a gal horn there, Terry, too? I do, but it's it's in my it's package. In I don't really that's want all right. to take it out. It's, it's, it's still, see, it's yeah. still yeah. 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 You can still see it's yeah. got a little so, knob on there. So yeah. Yeah. And we currently offer it in Canada, but we are totally happy to come to the States. Yeah. Um, we just essentially need someone with clinic and beds and people to fill them. So um, awesome. Well, <laughs> we, we're, we're talking. We, we might be bringing you to uh, Boulder, Colorado here. Um, so everybody stay tuned. We'll be announcing that. And, you know, I think that would be so fun to have you come and we'll do it at my house and, and have a lot of fun. So um, awesome. that's a possibility. OK, one last question, because. Um, postpartum, it, you know, there's considerations for us. I guess I'm curious about that, the tissue. Um, is there a difference postpartum in the, the vaginal tissue after someone's just had a baby that we need to be considered, you know, considerate of when we're thinking about pessaries or not? Do you want to go for it, Terry? Certainly. I feel like I did already touch on that just a little bit, just with, um, you know, estrogen certainly making sure that if if yeah if someone um can benefit from that and i know there are plenty of um lactating postpartum moms that are like oh i don't want to mess with my supply and you know topical estrogen has not been shown to to affect um milk supply but of course we know these things are a delicate balance for people but there are there are alternatives like hyaluronic acid uh topicals and other things to support the tissue but certainly you would um you know have a, an exam to make sure that that everything was, um, you know, everything was intact and, and looking looking good from from that perspective. And then just also one thing that we didn't say is, you know, navigating sex postpartum is already challenging. Um, and there are certainly, um, you know, pessaries that people can self-manage and pull out themselves. Um, and there are some that are like the ring, for instance, which is the most common kind that is not considered space occupying and it can be left in during penetrative intercourse. Um, although I've never tried it, I don't know. <laughs> um, they say it can, you know, they, it's, it's supposed to be uh, possible. So, you know, that it won't be just another thing to, to be a barrier um, for, for postpartum intercourse, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I was just going to say, talking about this postpartum period, like we take tissue considerations into effect when we're talking about people throughout the lifespan. So even menopausal, um, people who are peri or postmenopausal, we're considering where are they? How are their tissues responding? As we know, the estrogen is decreasing over time. Would they benefit from a supplemental estrogen, which in Canada is a medical decision? So I refer people back to their doctors or other forms of uh, vaginal moisturizer. Um, so that is a consideration throughout, as well as making sure they don't have other dermatological concerns like, like a sclerosis or, or you know, other undiagnosed concerns. Mm -hmm. It's always on our radars as pelvic physios, um, but that is something we consider throughout the lifespan because we're women and we're changing all the time. Absolutely, <laughs> so. absolutely. And so do you, um, so, I really appreciate you guys sharing this and everybody listening in know that Terry and Jenny and even Gaynor um, from uh, Morgan from uh, Belgium joined us for a pessary panel for the summit that's happening in April and um, we dive deeper into the weeds of pessaries and talk a little bit about all the different types of pessaries and lubrications to use with them and really the the um, why would you want to add it to your practice? And there's a lots of different topics that we cover there. So please um, make sure you listen into that uh, interview as well. If you are considering adding this to your practice and let me tell you, it is so needed. And I really think, you know, what would you guys say about, you know, adding pessary to your practice? What have you noticed about it since you've been doing that service? Yeah, for me, it's incredibly rewarding um, to be able to offer it in-house, have that rapport with my clients already, and have that, when it works, it works. It's instant. 
wow, I feel better. Wow. I just did my jumping jacks. Wow. I'm not thinking about my pelvis right now. What the heck? <laughs> right. Yeah, so yeah. it's incredibly rewarding. A little bit extra paperwork. You get into the groove of it. It's good. Okay. <laughs> <Just> do it. <laughs> right. Terry, any words of wisdom? Yeah. Yeah. And I started fairly minimally. I mean, I did a lot of kind of the education beforehand, um, but actually the, the implementation into the clinic, um, I didn't go the autoclave and fitting kit route because it's, you know, cost prohibitive to me in my practice right now. So I'm just going with the, um, the disposal method, which is where if you don't get the right fit the first time, you just have to choose another, choose another one and, and be really, really thorough with your investigations before you decide on which way to go. Um, and fit really specifically. So you try and get the right size. So um, that's how I've, you know, incorporated things. And, um, it, you know, there are certainly lots of more resources as we go into the to the summit um, talk that you can look back at as, as well and refer to. Yeah, thank you. I, I really appreciate what you guys shared there because it, um, it it's really tipping me over. I've been on the fence about doing it because I took Gainer's course and it was wonderful and I learned a lot about the different pessaries and stuff. But um, the implementation of it has been something that I've, I'm still kind of like, do I want to do this? Should I do this? I know I should because it's so needed. Um, but listening and doing that interview with you guys really has kind of tipped me over to like, okay, let's get Jenny on down here. Let's do some train, more training. Let's, let's figure this out. So thank you both for sharing your time and your wisdom with us. And, um, uh, do you guys have anything that you would like to offer that people could check out in the show notes that we could put any links or any, um, any gifts for anybody listening in? Yeah, for sure. So um, with hearing this uh, from two weeks from when this is aired, we do have a 10% discount on our course through Pelvic Health Solutions for our pessary fittings. Um, so that is an option, but regardless of when you hear it, if it's down the road, we can have the website link down there. We run it at least twice a year. So there will be lots of options that way. Great. And Jenny, do you, uh, or Terry, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. No, Terry, sorry, I meant... <laughs> Uh, I have a pessary resource guide that's more, um, it's more geared towards the U.S., but there are some links to different um, clinical practice guidelines and resources for ordering. Um, there, we, we ha I have a free um, Facebook group that's for pessary physios specifically, Yay. so you can look up Global Pessary Physio. That's also on the resource guide. Um, and then I also have a pelvic organ prolapse handout that I've um, done a limited copyright on so that you all can distribute it and really just want to get better information out there um, that's not so, um, that's a little bit more tailored and um, evidence-based than a lot of the handouts that we kind of see out there. So I'll list that as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, I so appreciate you two taking the time to share this information with us. I think my biggest takeaway is in that postpartum period, using pessaries to support those organs earlier on can really help give moms the support they need as they're trying to take care of that, those, the babes, right? And the lifting and the caring and all that that goes along with new motherhood. Um, a pessary fitting might be really, really supportive for them. So thank you for that. And thank you everybody for listening in and we will see you all on the next episode. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye. Today's podcast was brought to you by the Institute for Birth Healing. To discover more, visit instituteforbirthhealing.com. To claim $50 off of any online course, use coupon code PODCAST50 at checkout. Till next time, I'm Lynn Schulte, founder of the Institute for Birth Healing.